Next up is the imaging of dizziness. This is a controversial topic in imaging of the temporal bone. When I'm talking about dizziness in this context, I'm not talking about the sudden onset of true vertigo where the whole room is spinning like we associate with lateral medullary strokes. I'm talking about chronic dizziness with recurrent individual spells of dizziness. Uh, the things that cause this are vestibular schwannomas, otitis media, um, uh, neuritis of the vestibular nerve, um, perilymphatic uh, fistula. Uh, perilymphatic fistula is where there's a communication between the middle ear and the inner ear, and the perilymph and envelymph can leak out. We'll talk in depth about dehiscent superior semicircular canal as it relates to dizziness, and then these last two items, Meniere's disease and benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. I'm going to come back to those last two later. Vestibular neuritis is an unusual cause of dizziness. You see enhancement along the vestibular nerve or one of its branches, uh, linear enhancement within the internal auditory canal. Now, this can be very helpful as these patients may respond to uh, steroids. Perilymphatic fistula is what happens when there's a communication between the inner ear and the middle ear. The endolymph and perilymph that should be in the uh, inner ear leak out and uh, air leaks in to the uh, membranous labyrinth. Surgeons often refer to this as pneumo labyrinth, whereas radiologists tend to use the word perilymphatic fistula. I don't know how the surgeons ended up with a more radiologic term and the radiologists ended up with a more clinical term, but that seems to be how it plays out. Surprisingly, this does not always result in severe hearing loss. You'd think that would be a devastating injury to the, uh, to, to the inner ear. But it is a critical finding. It suggests that there may be an occult fracture or disruption of the oval or round windows. Uh, this is most frequently seen in the setting of trauma. Let's spend a little time talking about superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Now, I've got to be fair because superior semicircular canal dehiscence often presents with just conductive hearing loss. Um, and it doesn't necessarily present with dizziness, but I needed something to talk about in the dizziness section, so that's why it ends up here. Classically, superior semicircular canal dehiscence presents with Tulio's phenomenon. What's that? Tulio's phenomenon is dizziness in response to loud noises. For example, someone might say, when I walk into a party, I suddenly get dizzy. Or when I, a truck driver might say, when I walk down the right side of my truck, I'm fine. But when I walk down the left side of my truck, I get dizzy. And it's which ear is near the loud engine that, that makes that difference. Tulio's phenomenon was originally described in neurosyphilis, but we don't see a lot of tertiary syphilis anymore, so now it's more closely associated with superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Uh, superior semicircular canal dehiscence is a form of third window phenomenon. Um, you have two normal windows between the middle ear and the, in, and the inner ear, the oval window and the round window. The oval window has the stapes foot plate on it, and the stapes is sending vibrations into the oval window, so it's pretty clear what's going on, why you have an oval window. But why do you have a round window? You have a round window because it's very, very hard to compress liquids. Right? That's the whole principle behind hydraulics. It's hard to compress liquids. So when that stapes is pushing on the oval window, it doesn't want to compress the, uh, the, the contents of the inner ear. It wants to shift the contents of the inner ear. And that shift means something's got to give at the other end. The thing that's giving is the round window. So you've got these two windows where one's going in and the other's going out with the vibrations of the stapes. This is a very carefully orchestrated system where that pressure wave goes up one side of the cochlea, turns around, comes down the other side of the cochlea, it goes through the vestibule and then out through the round window. Very carefully orchestrated. If you put a third window anywhere into that system, it fouls the whole thing up. And our perceptions, our hearing, 
uh, perceptions and our um, vestibular uh, perceptions get messed up whenever a loud noise causes vibrations in the inner ear. That's the third window phenomenon uh, of which uh, superior semicircular canal dehiscence is the most common example. Another thing to understand about uh, SSCD is that it can be imaged in the planes of Stenver and Poschel. These planes are carryovers from the plane film days. Uh, the plane of Stenver is perpendicular to the superior semicircular canal. Uh, the plane of Poschel is in the plane of the superior semicircular canal. I'll show you examples of those. This is an axial image through the very top of the superior semicircular canal. You can see that the angle of the superior semicircular canal is about 45 degrees, halfway between sagittal and coronal. We use this 45 degrees when we create reformatted images in the plane of Stenver and Poschel. If you are making cuts perpendicular to that superior semicircular canal, then you are in the plane of Stenver. If you are making reformatted images that are parallel to the angle of the superior semicircular canal, then you are in the plane of Poschel. This is a reformatted image in the plane of Poschel. You can see the entirety of the superior semicircular canal, and you can see a nice bony covering protecting it from the intracranial vault. This is a patient with superior semicircular canal dehiscence. That nice bony covering is absent over the top of the superior semicircular canal. This is called the subarcuate canal, by the way, as it runs right under the arch of the superior semicircular canal. When we turn to the plane of Stenver, you see the superior semicircular canal in cross section as a round lucency. Right? You can see a nice bony covering over the top of the superior semicircular canal. Here is a patient with uh, canal dehiscence, and you can see that, there, that it lacks the bony covering over the top. Be very careful uh, about this diagnosis. Even the slightest amount of bone is sufficiently protective. So if you see two bony projections coming together and almost meeting in the middle, that's probably intact. That's probably not dehiscence. I think that the error that most people make is being too eager to call positive cases of superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Really, it should appear very rarely. So how good is a plain old coronal image? Do you really need to go through the trouble of doing these 45 degree reformatted images in the plane of Poschel and Stenver? The answer is you really don't. It turns out that a coronal image is just as accurate as reformatted images in the planes of Stenver and Poschel. They're pretty images. Uh, if there's any question in your mind, you can go back and reformat, but I wouldn't recommend using, uh, making your text create those reformats routinely. It's extra images to look at and doesn't add to your diagnostic ac accuracy. Here's a standard coronal reformat showing um, the superior semicircular canal almost in cross section. You can see a nice bony covering there. You can see the dehiscent superior semicircular canal here lacking the top of the bony covering. Coronal reformatted images are sufficient for the diagnosis of superior semicircular canal dehiscence. You don't actually need those fancy 45 degree reformats. To put it another way, routine reformats in the planes of Stenver and Poschel are probably wasteful. You can reserve those reformats for situations where you're uncertain about the diagnosis based on the coronal images alone. Initial studies on the rate of incidental superior canal dehiscence suggested that some 10% of the population would be incorrectly diagnosed with this disease if we based it on radiology alone. But those studies were done before we even had helical CT. If you are using modern CT scanners, and by which I mean 64 slice or better CT scanners, then the rate of incidental asymptomatic superior canal dehiscence is extremely low, less than 1%. 
if you have a patient without a history of hearing loss and without a history of dizziness in whom you genuinely see a lack of a, a bony margin along the superior semicircular canal, that patient probably has subclinical hearing loss and would uh, benefit from audiometry. So it's very rare to truly see this incidentally. But you've got to read these cases with a high specificity. Don't overcall superior semicircular canal dehiscence and then recommend audiometry. It's a little counterintuitive that superior canal dehiscence would produce conductive hearing loss instead of sensorineural hearing loss. You'd expect an abnormality of the inner ear to produce sensorineural hearing loss. But remember that we differentiate between conductive hearing loss and sensorineural hearing loss based on the difference between air conduction of sound and bone conduction of sound. For superior canal dehiscence, the air conduction is messed up in the ways that we described, but bone conduction bypasses that entire stapes foot plate vibrating thing and goes straight into stimulating the nerve within the cochlea. So that's why we end up with preserved bone conduction and abnormal air conduction that we call conductive hearing loss. So even though it's a problem of the inner ear, it produces conductive hearing loss. Okay, I promised that I would come back to these last two diagnoses. Why are they in yellow despite the fact that they're at the bottom of the list? They are in yellow because they are the two most common diagnoses that produce chronic dizziness. Meniere's disease or endolymphatic high drops is enlargement of the endolymphatic space at the expense of the surrounding perilymphatic space. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is a displacement of otoliths within the uh, inner ear that can be usually brought back into alignment with some special maneuvers. Between the two of them, they account for 90% of dizziness. In previous versions of this lecture, I used to say that there are no imaging findings for either of those diagnoses, and that's why imaging for dizziness has extremely poor yield, which, it, which is true, it, it really does. Um, probably less than 1%. However, Recently, some new findings um, that allow us to diagnose Meniere's disease have come to light. There are several radiologic ways to establish a diagnosis of Meniere's disease. The best way to do this is intratympanic contrast injection. You take a small needle, put it across the tympanic membrane, and inject a dilute solution of gadolinium. That, uh, over the next 24 hours, that gadolinium is preferentially taken up by the perilymph, not the endolymph. And so when you do high-resolution 3D flare imaging, the endolymph still suppresses, but the perilymph does not. And you can distinguish between those two spaces and see how the endolymphatic cavity has enlarged relative to the perilymphatic cavity. These are beautiful pictures, um, but it's an invasive technique and you have to wait 24 hours before you image. You can do a, another way, do the same idea another way that isn't quite as nice, and that's delayed IV contrast. You can give intravenous gadolinium and then wait six hours and image. And it's not as nice as the intratympanic injection, but you still get preferential uptake of the uh, gadolinium into the perilymph, and so high resolution flare imaging can do the same thing. It's just not as, not as pretty. There's a third way of establishing uh, the diagnosis of Meniere's disease, and that's using our traditional everyday steady state free procession sequences, or even a 3D T2 weighted sequence that we would routinely get for imaging of the temporal bone. This has a big advantage in that it doesn't require any delay at all. You don't have to wait six hours. You don't need contrast and you don't have to do uh, uh, an intratympanic injection. Unfortunately, it's neither as sensitive nor as specific as the above techniques. So it's not as good a technique, but it is much, much more convenient. This is what the normal vestibule should look like on a steady state free procession image. 
you can see that there's actually two different colors in the vestibule. There is an outer brighter signal and an inner darker signal. I mean, these are both bright signals, but relative to one another, you can see that there is brighter signal around the periphery and darker signal centrally. This is a, the endolymph centrally and the perilymph peripherally within the vestibule. Note the relationship in size. The endolymphatic cavity is a, just a thin little stripe down the center of the vestibule on both sides. Now here is a patient with Meniere's disease. It's not just a little thin line of endolymph down the center. Now there's this ball of, of endolymph displacing the perilymph out front, representing the utricle of the ventricle. Here's a more thorough case of Meniere's disease where the endolymphatic cavity is taking up most of the vestibule anteriorly and posteriorly and even into the posterior limb of the semicircular canal. This is not a definitive way of making the diagnosis of Meniere's disease. You can only suggest the diagnosis and recommend further testing because the findings only about 80% specific with this technique. Uh, usually when we see this finding, we see it bilaterally, even if the patient only has unilateral symptoms. Uh, evidently, the endolymphatic hydropsy is occurring bilaterally, even if it only reaches a clinical threshold on one side. In conclusion, remember that imaging for chronic dizziness has a very low yield. You're usually not going to find anything, but there are some important diagnoses on these lists that we don't want to overlook.